Welcome, I'm Pete Perfides. Thank you for joining me. You're listening to the Ace Records podcast, and I am very excited to have with me um, one of my favourite musicians, one of my favourite singers. She's been one of my favourite singers since the early 80s, when I suppose I first heard her voice on a Cherry Red Records compilation, Pillows and Prayers, or it may have even been the first chart pop single she released with her group Everything But The Girl Back in 1984, I think, each and every one. And she's made many more wonderful records uh, since, both with Everything But The Girl and, of course, on her own. Uh, She's also a published author now, so she's one of my favourite writers as well. She has had three books published to date, Bedsit Disco Queen, Naked at the Albert Hall, and her brand new book, Another Planet. And she's sitting opposite me, Tracy Thord. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me here. It's always lovely to be here. Um, so uh, do you it's, Do you stop and pinch yourself sometimes and say, oh my word, I am a published author now? Yeah, I'm, it's still exciting seeing an actual finished book in front of you. Yes. I mean, you know, when you're working on writing books, you, you do it all in notebooks and on your laptop. And it, sometimes when you're reading stuff back, yeah. it, it, you know, it doesn't look like a proper book. No. It looks just like paragraphs one after the other yeah, and it doesn't absolutely. really and as soon as you see it actually printed out and you know with a cover on and book shaped it seems to just go up a notch in terms of how good it reads it just yeah. it seems better your writing seems better so but it's, it's a amazing. bit like that do you not find it's a bit like that when uh you know your writing is published and, and well even before your writing is published if someone says something good about something you've written then you can go back and read it and pretend to be that person yes and it seems better doesn't it that i had that absolute experience with this new book another planet so i'd got to the stage where i'd written sort of draft two of Mm. it and i sent it off to my editor francis at canongate and i reread it myself one evening and thought this you know there's some good stuff in here but this is mostly very bad um it needs a lot of work the next the very next day i went and had lunch (laughs) with him at which lunch he told me it was mostly very good (laughs) so which cheered me up no end. And then I went home and read it again. Mm. And sure enough, it struck me as being mostly <laughs> very, very good. good. Yeah, funny that, isn't it? So it's very weird. <laughs> and what what was it that, what was your main misgiving about it then when you sort of, you know, as you, one inevitably must, you hand it over for someone to read and then you're nervously waiting for that reaction? I think it's, I do think it's that classic imposter syndrome thing still, mm. that when you read stuff you've written, it's very hard to completely believe in it with the same degree of sort of authority as you believe when you read something Mm. written by someone else. Mm. You know, Mm. you read other people's writing and you just sort of accept that they know what they're talking about, Mm. that they have, you know, the right to be saying these things, that their opinions count and matter. Even if you don't always agree with them, you just sort of... You know, you take for granted that that this is their writing and you you take it seriously. But with your own stuff, I think you just all the little negative voices in your head kind of chip in saying, well, hang on, you might have got that wrong. Or supposing, you know, you're making this assertion here about something, but, you know, you someone could disagree with you. And what was that sort of what was the original, you know, uh, what was the sort of one line pitch you gave to yourself really that? Because, you know, I think we ha- we all have sort of thoughts that you think, oh, that could be a, a book. But what's the thing? In, what was the thing in this case that transformed it from just another idea that could be a book to be, well, actually, I think this is it? It was, um, there was a moment when a lot of it sort of coalesced around coming up with the actual title. Hmm. Um, and I'd, I'd actually written, first of all, a long essay, um, which was called Green Belt and which was about growing up in the green belt sort Mm. of area of those suburbs that are not just suburbs because they sort of sprawl out from the city, but they're actually a bit separated from the city by this, you know, the green belt around London. And that's where I grew up. And so that was the original idea. But it was quite narrow. It was quite focused on just the, the place. And I knew I needed to incorporate other things, you know, to make it book sized and make it a bit bigger in its themes. And I was talking to my sister and I was talking about how I wanted to include a bit more stuff about our parents and the family. Um, And we were talking just about, you know, how I did often feel a bit separate from my parents and Mm. felt like they didn't quite understand me. And she said, oh, you remember that thing dad always used to say about you in recent years? 
you know, he'd, he'd be talking to me, she said, and he'd say, oh, you know, Tracy's just done this. Gosh, she's from another planet. <laughs> and this is when I would have done some, you know, quite mundane, normal thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just, that line sank in. And I said to my sister at that time, I said, my God, I think that could be a brilliant title for the book. And it immediately gives me this whole kind of new territory to talk about, which is about, you know, the way your parents don't understand you. You know, it, it implies as well that suburbia hmm. is another planet. It's yeah, like no, it's, it's own place. I can totally see why um, it would have taken you to that place. Yeah. Um, your your dad, you know, even before reading this, you know, see, it was like an, it, see, it seems a very intriguing character in terms of his perception of you as well. Um, was, wasn't it, didn't he, after the first book came out, it was, didn't he say something like, I, I didn't know she was, yeah. she was into music. Didn't know something. she was, didn't know she was so into music. He said that after <laughs> Bed's a Disco Queen came out, you know, by which time my entire musical career had been and gone. It's all, it's not like, you know, it was yet to happen. He, yeah. I don't know what he thought I was doing all those years, um, <laughs> that it came as a surprise to him. But, you know, I guess the point is, you know, Parents don't really understand their kids a no. lot of the time. And do you think parent? Do you think you understand your children more than your parents understood you? Well, it's a good question. I I like to think I do, and I think we're we're closer in the sense that we have more, you know, open conversations than mm. I had with my parents by the time I was mm. a late teenager and a young adult. Yeah. Um, by that stage, I think we'd already agreed that we were from different planets yeah, and yeah. we were trying to be civil to each other but that yeah. was you know the the best of it whereas I talk to all my kids much more about you know their likes and dislikes and their feelings yeah. and their hopes and fears and so I think I understand them more. Is it a surprise to you sometimes I, I, part of the reason I ask is it's a surprise to me that it's going so well sometimes in, yeah. ter in terms of that shared shared understanding shared references and uh I almost think, am I kidding? My, you know, sometimes I wonder if I'm just kidding myself and I'm just actually as as kind of removed from it as my parents were from... I remember when my kids reached their teens that I was slightly braced waiting for it to start going wrong. Mm. I think because I expected, you know, that the, the way it went wrong for me and my parents was just inevitable. That, that yeah, was just yeah. what happened yeah, when yeah, teenagers yeah. and parents collided. And a lot of people will, you know... It, it, constantly give you dire warnings that that's mm. what's about to happen if you say to someone if someone says to you you know how old are your kids and you go oh 13 and they'll go oh oh <laughs> oh you've got it all coming then and you think oh well okay yeah i mean yeah, i'm I sure, they'll be, when that sure there'll be difficult bits <laughs> but you know here we are now my oldest girls are 21 and the youngest is 17 and we all get on really, really well. They don't have so. to say it with that much relish as well. No, you know, exactly. when people say you're like, oh, you got it coming to you. I know. You. I think people are desperate, you know, to see you make their mistakes. I know. A certain <laughs> amount of projection, I always think, yeah. sort of is kind of happening at times like that. Yeah. So it starts with this sort of fascinating uh, sort of journey sort of back into into the suburbs where you grew up mm. and you so so you go from your current um where you live currently in northwest london and these and it's all and I, i'll happily read it sort of anyone describing that sort of journey where you know and as you say like, i think there were like five people left on the train by yes. the time you you sort of got off yeah and it is especially when you're going and i because I, I grew up in birmingham and i get yeah. this going back to birmingham i sort of the other week i went um i just drove around the streets where I, I sort of grew up I didn't even know what I was looking for I, I didn't even know what I was trying to sort of um you know sate some sort of yearning or curiosity yeah and I get and I got that really um at times with you yeah I mean that you know when I went back to visit Brookman's Park which is the little village not a village that yeah. I grew up in I hadn't been back there for a very long time because yeah. my parents had moved away so you know there was a good period of 20 years or so when I didn't have any reason to go back there and I visited at the start of this writing project thinking well <laughs> I need to actually physically go there and it did feel like a you know psychological journey as much as a physical one I I was so astonished by how near it is yes you know in my mind it's hundreds of miles away it's it's almost fictional in my mind i think mm. of it it's brigadoon or something you know it's it's a bit imaginary did you like it um well <laughs> it felt incredibly familiar mm. um as soon as i walked down from the station i felt 
sort of at home, you know, mm. because I knew every single corner, every yeah. curbstone, every mm. tree. Mm. Um, but pretty soon I had all the same feelings I always had, which is, you know, it feels like everyone's looking at me. Where is everyone? Why is it so quiet? Um, D- would it feeling all, a bit would, spooked. <laughs> did it really... For us? Did it... For, I, well, I've got to ask... Yeah. Even notwithstanding the possibility of them recognising you, you got, was that feeling of people looking at you? Was it? It was more to do with being in a small town and people knowing your business. Yeah, de- definitely not. I didn't think at all. Oh, people might recognise yeah. me and sort of go, "Here's our famous, <laughs> you know, our alumnus of walking Park. the streets." It was more that feeling that I thought neck curtains would be twitching and that mm. sort of, "Here's a stranger, yeah, <laughs> come to town." And it's kind of often compounded when. Um, you, you know, certainly, I, even now, I sort of go back and, and visit my parents and they will talk in great detail about what everybody who lives on the street has been doing lately. Yes. I, I don't know these people. And, I, you know, I, with the best will in the world, I, I listen. <laughs> but yeah. um, but I, I, there is a part of me that sort of thinks... You know why I'm I why you why why are you telling me this why why do I not feel it's appropriate to tell you about what the various people on my street are doing Yeah, but um, I do, I still I don't I'm not sure I have an answer to that. No, but, and that's one of the things I wanted to escape from. I remember when I was growing up there and thinking about what it would be like to live in a city. One of the things that was so appealing was the idea of being anonymous in the crowd yeah you know i liked the idea of a city being busier and thronged with people and a variety of people i thought that would be great but also that you could do whatever you liked and no one would care no one would be looking at you it wouldn't be anyone's business and that's a kind of and you mentioned this almost in those terms but you refer to a kind of um almost like a kind of humanity, like an unspoken humanity about London. Yeah. In, in that there is, it's, and a lot of people mistake it for coldness and unfriendliness, yeah. but it's a kind of mutual respect born of no, the knowledge that we're all so close together. I think so. I yeah. think it is that thing of giving everyone a bit of space. Mm. You know, the, the way when you watch a busy street, everyone sort of instinctively mm. <laughs> manoeuvres around each yeah. other. Yeah. Um, And, you know, you watch people on the tube and, yeah, it can kind of seem cold that everyone's not looking, but physically everyone's very close together. Mm. So you have to do something to create a little bit of separateness and privacy. So, you know, people reading books and people with headphones on. But I like that. I think it's a sort of you are actually all having a shared experience because you're all experiencing this tube journey. Yeah, totally. Um, But at the same time, you've got you know a little bit of separateness and a little bit of individuality yeah it's a fight it's like a it's like a human ecosystem that, yeah um it and it's actually quite beautiful when you sort of kind of when the penny drops and that's kind of how you start to um perceive it yeah um yeah i, th- I sort of think that certainly sometimes i've got this kind of ambivalence about the the, the suburbs and a mm. lot of the suburbs that you mentioned uh, because you know you you describe being on the the, tr- the train line that kind of almost goes practically past my house yeah and so and i occasionally sort of go go on just will go somewhere um and have a sort of fantasy uh, fantasy day of of like uh, of the you know the life that i might have had there. yeah and i'm not sure if it's sustained like a few um a few weeks ago i spent a night in letchworth i didn't have to no one forced me and my kind of ostensible reason for doing so was that um catelyn as you know my wife she sort of she's got a very large family and she was having him over for a kind of pre-christmas gathering and she said and i had i was trying to finish a book at the time and mm. uh, she said look if you want to have a couple of days just um somewhere else just go for it i don't mind and uh and so i like randomly chose letchworth for reasons kind of not dissimilar really to to some of the, some of the things that you touch on in your book just that sort of how does life work in a sort of play in a kind of in a not quite a market town it's bigger yeah. than that and you know it's supposed to be a very nice bookshop there isn't there <clears throat> Yeah, it's a record shop as well. Book and book and record shop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do recommend. hear good things about. It. And I stayed at the premier uh, at the premier inn, mm. and it was weird because I didn't even tell anyone where I was. I literally no one knew where I was, and um, <laughs> so I thought it'd be quite weird if I just <clears throat> if I had a heart attack in the hotel, and they're like, and they're like, I was found, and people so why what was, was he was doing he in Letchworth? <laughs> what was he doing in Letchworth? Yeah, but in a sense, 
like there's there's a kind of easy life that you can have in the suburbs because they're these kind of wonderful kind of town planning machines yeah. that exist to expedite an easy life. Yeah, definitely. Is that appealing to you? Well, it, it isn't. But the, in the process of writing the book, I became a lot more sympathetic mm. to the, the notion of why it was appealing, especially to my parents. Yeah. I mean, Brookmans Park is a weird one because it was built, it was planned around the same sort of time as Welling Garden City, which is only a couple of miles away. Mm. And it was planned to be a similar kind of place, a lot bigger. Mm. Um, and so the building started in the, I think the late 1920s, a lot of it was built in the 30s. Yeah. And so the railway station is there. That's the reason for it being there. You can get directly into mm. London. So mm. it's a perfect commuter town was yes. the idea. So they built some houses, then they built this village green and a lot of shops it's very well served for shops. Mm. It's got a primary school. It's got a secondary school. It's got a church. Mm. It's got a pub with some rooms above it. Um, it's had a petrol station. It had a GP. It had a dentist. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. so well set up. Yeah. And then the Green Belt thing happened, mm. I think, in the 40s, just after the war. And the building stopped. So from this town that was kind of set up to be... As you say, you know, this really well-designed place with mm. all the facilities you'd need yeah. and, you know, a thriving big community. Yeah. It actually got completely stuck and it stayed as this quite small. I mean, it is quite small, literally yeah. a few thousand people, but with everything it needs. Yeah. So which made it become even more sort of insular and yeah. self-contained. I yeah. grew up living a lovely childhood, really. You know, I didn't have to go anywhere for anything. No, <laughs> could I? Walk to school, walk to the shops. Yeah. Um, but then becoming a teenager, I suddenly realised, but this is weird, mm. you know, living in a place where everything's there. And the, the men would all get on the train and go up to London to work. All the yeah. women were housewives and mothers. Mm. And it was a bit Stepford and a bit yeah. Truman Show, you know, yeah. just this thing where it felt a bit unreal. And you explore that thing a little bit with your edge around it a little bit with your with your mother as well and you seem yeah. and, and a lot of it you know you seem sort of unclear as to, to to what degree you could call her sort of a happy woman. Yeah, and and I you know when in in my teens we fell out very badly. Um in retrospect I now look back and realize she was going through her menopause. I yeah. think she suffered from a lot of anxiety issues. Um you know, I think she was. I think she was thwarted and frustrated, yeah. but didn't have an outlet or a language for that. So she focused everything onto the kids and the family, yeah. as women like that did. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, absolutely, understandably. And she went to her GP at one point and got put on Valium, you know, which was the solution in the 1970s mm. for frustrated housewives. Yeah. Um, and so we ended up very, very distant from each other. You know, I was doing the opposite. I was trying to react to the sort of thought yeah. frustrated thing by looking out into the big world and going okay look you know yeah. this place is driving us both mad so what's what, yeah. how do you get out it's quite a common thing as well for yeah. parents especially for uh, mothers i think of that yeah. generation to um look at the th you know to gaze on as their children go out and, and get the things that you know, for kind of societal reasons or cultural reasons, what you know, were not available to them, mm. and perhaps without even realizing it, slightly resent them. Yeah. For was that would do that? I th I think definitely. You know, my mum was clever. Um, she'd enjoyed school, but she would had to leave at fifteen, like mm. people did in those days. And yeah. then the war came. Um, she worked as a secretary for a few years and then as soon as she got married and had kids, that was it. She stopped work. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, when I, she used to tell stories of what she was like when she was younger and she sounded an absolute laugh. Yeah. You know, yeah. she liked going out. She liked dancing. Yeah. She used to talk about how she wore too much thick foundation makeup and it would all rub off on my dad's shirts, mm -hmm. you know, when they were kissing. And there was this brilliant story she used to tell about when he was in the, RAF and he was I think he was posted somewhere training and she went out one they weren't married yet they were just courting um, mm. but she went out to a dance with another man mm. and he came home unexpectedly my dad and was told that she was at this dance so he turned up there as well the <laughs> other man had just bought her a cherry brandy so my dad said I'll buy her a cherry brandy so she's I always used to picture her standing there with a cherry brandy in each hand and I just used to think I'd have liked you, you know, yeah, yeah. you were good fun. 
That's such a poignant <laughs> image, this woman with a cherry brandy in each hand. I know, I th- and I always think probably thoroughly enjoying herself, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it um, is, um, it's, yeah, I'm, a couple of things I'm reminded of when you said that. First of all, to both um, music related, first of all, I think of that song by, um, do you know, that song, a Michelle Shocked song called Anchorage. Mm, yeah. And uh, okay, so for people who don't know, yeah. right, so it's about, it's a kind of, she's relaying a kind of correspondence she has with yeah. her old friend, isn't she? Yeah. And her old friend has has moved, got married, settled down and gone yeah. to Anchorage, Alaska. And, uh, and there's this line in it where she says, I think I'm a housewife. Yeah. And it's so, it breaks your heart. I know. It? It's, and it's so well delivered as well. Yeah. yeah. It's like she yeah. realizes it like the moment That's she writes. That's what she's them. turned into. Yeah. yeah. And I, and it's true, you know, for, I don't know, for young women of my sort of generation, just the word housewife would strike <laughs> fear into your heart. It was mm. a terrifying thing to think of becoming. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it kind of, it's kind of, it connotes incarceration, doesn't it? Does, it does. And it was really, you know, again, I think it was held up as what we were probably leading to. That's why it was so scary because it wasn't, you know, later generations could probably just laugh it off and go, well, obviously I'm never going to be that. But I think I grew up in the knowledge that that was a fate that possibly awaited me. Yeah, it's like, you know, Um, it's a bit like, um, you know, uh, maybe not as extreme, but, you know, sort of maybe if you grow up in a in a culture where sort of arranged marriages are expected yeah. and you just i mean you know i i sort of had a kind of soups on of that um uh if if you grow up in a sort of greek background then the kind of way things are traditionally done is it's seen as a marriage of families right. so yeah. you 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 know if there's someone in a family that's roughly your age <laughs> then the two families will get together yeah. and then they will sort of talk about the possibility of you meeting with the, the potential significant other from their family and I remember my parents t- telling me that this is kind of what's supposed to happen right when I was about 10 yeah I was like are you fucking joking yeah. are you do you think <laughs> that that is ever going to I mean you know yeah so it, yeah it's that sort of thing that I, that's really that's not what I had planned no and um, and I did the thing is I, I remember being frightened of that but not knowing what the alternatives were mm. which you know again was why it was so exciting and inspiring then to see women doing other things which is how I ended up getting Mm. so you know inspired by Patti Smith and Mm. Susie Sue and polystyrene and suddenly out of nowhere it seemed like there was this explosion of you know really radical seeming women and they're just doing other stuff did your mother ever offer opinions (laughs) on these I think she was horrified I mean you know she Obviously, they didn't like the music I was listening to. To them, it was just discordant rubbish. Mm. And they very much hated the aggressiveness of it. Mm. Um, And, you know, I was criticised very much for being unfeminine Mm. by Mm. my parents. They would really say, you know, oh, God, this music you listen to, it's so aggressive. Why are you going out looking like that? You look so unfeminine. And I'd be going, yeah, that's the point. (laughs) You know, this is so liberating being able to go out. Was it like was it just liberating? Was there any? Do you feel a little guilty? Maybe was I there... felt very guilty. I was incredibly conflicted about it all. Okay. I didn't want to be at odds with my parents. No, no, really, no. I think at heart I'm not a natural um, rebel, if you like. No. I kind of rebelled because I had to because what they were offering just wouldn't have worked for me. Mm. But I would much I would much rather have been like my kids are, yeah. which is they've lived their teenage. Um, doing stuff they've wanted to do, being able to express themselves, having freedom, and also being able to get on with their parents. That's what I would have liked, really. And you went to university in Hull, and you obviously you met Ben there, and uh, I feel like Eamon Andrews. Sort of, <laughs> and then you went... To, <laughs> You're going you to bring him on? <laughs> to university we found in Hull. Ben. You haven't seen him for 30 years. Oh, no, actually, you saw him this morning. <laughs> And there in the common room. <laughs> no, so, uh, so you, <laughs> so yeah, no, but he, um, he was someone who had a very different kind of relationship, especially with his father. Um, yeah. Who, who, which was probably slightly closer in some ways to the one, you know, he's 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 groovy dad. Yeah. Who didn't they smoke a joint together on they the way? They did on their to... way up to Hull. By the time I met Ben that afternoon, 
He'd already had the experience of his dad driving him up and they'd sparked up a joint as they crossed the Humber Bridge and his dad bung Count Basie on, <laughs> turned the volume up, windows down, smoking a joint as they crossed the Humber Bridge. Then they arrived at the student house, both a bit stoned. Yeah. Um, they kind of breeze in. Ben's dad sits down. A couple of the other students had arrived already. Mm. Ben's dad says to them, stick the kettle on, lads, and help get that trunk out the car, which they duly do, bring it in. So, That's yeah, that amazing, was his introduction to student life. Meanwhile, my parents had brought me up probably looking a bit disapprovingly at my room and you so, know, gone off in tears. And so the, um, well, and things get... That's interesting, isn't it? Because there's always a time when you kind of get into a serious relationship with someone. They have to meet your parents and you have to meet their parents. Mm. And it must have been far more onerous for you to think of the prospect of Ben meeting your parents, I would imagine, than the other way around. Yeah, it was very difficult. And they didn't, you know, naturally hit it off at all. And he was used to being able to speak to parents like adults and, Mm. you know, speak his mind, be opinionated, tell dirty jokes, swear... All the kind of, you know, normal stuff, which he then proceeded to do in front of my parents who were Did they expect and to be addressed as Mr and Mrs Thorne? No, not as bad as that. Yeah. Um, but it was definite, you know, expected to sleep in separate rooms. Yeah. And I remember Ben coming to visit for the first time. And I think on our first, like, holiday from university, when we were both back down, he came over to stay. And, you know, we went up to my bedroom, like you yeah. do, yeah. Um, just to, you know, sit and talk. And my mum came and opened the door and left the door open. Like, oh. And I remember just thinking, is it 1955 still? And yes, apparently it is. <laughs> have you, told, you must have told your children that story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they can't imagine it, obviously. Yeah. And then when Ben and I started living together, that was it. I mean... We really, really fell out. They, you know, Hmm. didn't go as far as kind of ostracising me. But, you know, I didn't see much of them for the next few. They didn't see Ben at all for a couple of years um, until we'd lived together for long enough that they thought, okay, maybe this is serious and we're going to have to speak to him. Was it easier to write this book sort of knowing that they wouldn't read it? Yeah, I don't. I honestly don't think I could have written it, you know, which is I know quite common when people write things about family Hmm. and... You know, it's that weird feeling that I really don't think I could have sent this book to either of my parents to read. No, which, no. which is an interesting thing, given that I have already, you know, I wrote Bedsit Disco Queen when they were both still alive. Yeah. And, you know, there is stuff left out of it, honestly. Mm. So, you know, it, maybe there is a sense in which I went back over some of that ground because I thought, OK, now, now I'm going to tell you the real story. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Um, and uh, and obviously, as it, I think is a lot of with a lot of sort of people who grew up after the sixties, a big engine of that sort of drive to kind of find out what your own story is is quite simply top of the pops. Yeah. And so it sort of came to be for you. Yes. It's this very. Um, I don't think it will ever really be possible to sort of convey maybe to to. You know, obviously, the world has changed. Uh, what, a, what, what, what a disruptive, potentially disruptive thing this thing can be that just lands in in your front room on Thursday evening. Totally, and you know, it's and it's and maybe in you know there are certain moments as well when what's happening on top of the pops was sort of particularly likely to provoke mm. <laughs> parents of a certain generation, especially. So, you know. I know lots of people have their memories of watching, you know, Bowie doing Starman or something. But for me, it was a little bit later than that. Mm. It was the period when the punk group started appearing on there. Um, And I'd already, you know, I'd got some of the records and was getting into things. And so my parents were a bit aware that there was this noise emanating Mm. from my bedroom. But then, you know, to actually see what the Sex Pistols looked like, there they are doing Pretty Vacant or something, you know. I I just remember them being unable to understand you know how yeah. what is likable about this um yeah and although i you know i i sort of i remember feeling excited at my, at my bro- older brother getting into the mm. sex pistols i i also have a certain amount of sympathy <laughs> for yeah. my parents as well <laughs> because how could they yeah. really you know and that that was the point wasn't it it was designed obviously mm. to offend and alienate that generation yeah. um so, you know, there there were definite moments um, of just, you know, complete sort of mutual incomprehension yeah, and yeah. and me getting more and more, um, you know, drawn into that world of music. And it, it, it just kind of fell like a 
curtain between yeah, <laughs> me and yeah. my parents. And, you know, one that I was quite happy to then, I mean, hide behind in a way. I used yeah. it as something that was a way of helping me sometimes to say things I couldn't say. You know, here's this loud record that's shouting and mm, being obscene. Yeah, proxy. And so I can put that on and I don't have to say anything because mm. it's, it's shouting and screaming and doing all the stuff for me. And, you know, that's a way in which music can be so useful you know that thing of it it speaking for you and it being rebellious in a way maybe you you're too timid to be but yeah yeah because you um started making records very young you know your the, the you know the venn diagram if you like of your you're starting to make records and that kind of window of your life mm. where you you still get obsessed with new musicians you know the two overlapped didn't they so mm. you, there's this uh, strange period where you know you were kind of h- hero worshipping people like Morrissey weren't you and yet you he was your peer yeah I mean that you know that came a little bit later I guess when you know when I went off to Hull and the Smiths first appeared in what sort of 83 82 mm. 83 and so yeah I'd already had a couple of records out and then um, got madly into the Smiths and you know then had the weird experience of I still just did feel like a student who was a fan yeah. of the Smiths um, but you know then there was a weird thing when at the end of that year I think in the NME Morrissey chose me as his favourite female singer <laughs> and I I couldn't quite get my head around it I was a bit still sort of has he even heard of me <laughs> and were you um, what would what would your friends think of that ah oh, well that was that weird period you know when me and Ben were at university when almost no one ever mentioned it it was kind of just I don't know Cause there was, was I was nicknamed pop star trace yes for a right. while yeah, yeah yeah um so it was just kind of made a bit of a joke of in that, that quite British way I think yeah understatement let's take the mickey a bit because what's the alternative are you actually gonna you know Make a yeah. fuss of her. That would be awful. Yeah, and also there is still, you know, there's, pe- you know, p- people of that age are sort of in denial of their social awkwardness. It's like, you know, you never like when you're in your early twenties. It's a bit like having someone who be- who acquires fame mm. is a li- in your friendship group is a little bit like f- knowing someone who's been bereaved. You yeah. just don't know what don't to know say. what to say. <laughs> no, I think that's really true. So people just chose. Not to say anything, which was probably for the best. And when you do say things, you can often just say really dumb things. Yeah. Just like, what what on earth did I say that for? You know, so it's kind of... But also when you're young, you kind of take things a bit in your stride anyway. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what the way things unfold just seems normal or natural to you because that's what's happening. Whereas now I look back and think... You know, and when I talk to my kids about it, they say, but so what, hang on, you were at university and you, you know, you'd already released two albums and then you recorded two more while you were there, <laughs> you know, and I think, well, it does sound a bit far-fetched when you yeah. look at it like that. But again, I suppose you have to remember that everything was, you know, it was very indie and DIY. So when you say recording an album, that was like two afternoons work or something. It wasn't like booking out you know compass point for six yeah, months yeah, or something also know. do you know what the other things are i just think there's just no your life has no admin at that point no and like you know so now like you know if if i was to map out my dream week a lot of it would consist of sort of writing and kind of getting my radio show ready yeah. or whatever you know but actually you know there's probably about two days of just admin yeah just like and yeah and i sort of think and that's just me so yeah. i think about you know sometimes i think uh, God, it's probably like this for Johnny Marr. You know, Johnny Marr <laughs> probably has to do, like, on any given... He probably just has to sort out Smith's bullshit of one kind or another oh, just for yeah. two days in any given week. Yeah, there is a certain amount of past bullshit that mm. needs endless sorting out. Yeah, Give me an example of some of your past bullshit that would <laughs> just... like that, that Someone like me would never even imagine is just a time-consuming bore for you. Um, at the moment, we're trying to find... Uh, the original artwork for one of our album covers for a reissue. Right. Okay. And um, that's proved to be an <laughs> extraordinarily <laughs> boring amount of bullshit. Which album? The person, I think it's Amplified Heart. Right. And um, no one seems to have it anyway. So we this week we just got a huge delivery of some stuff that had been sent over from America, boxes of stuff that we've literally arrived on our doorstep. And Ben was like, here it is, it's going to be in here somewhere. Was it in there? <laughs> 
<laughs> Read her. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Literally piles of other stuff. I mean, it's quite interesting, you know, yeah, photos yeah. of us that we'd forgotten ideas for sleeves that we'd forgotten but then i said to him at the end of it when the thing we actually need wasn't in there i said so is that now being added to the stuff in the garage (laughs) of which there is quite a lot Um, so yeah just stuff that you kind of feel should we hang on to this you know master tapes videos boxes of interviews um you just have to you kind of think you have to but it feels a bit oh god am i just leaving stuff that my kids are one day gonna have to guiltily burn yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) but just give formally give them dispensation please Um, yeah please just in a skip all of it and um so um it's in going back to something you said earlier the uh, you talked about your mother um you know, having to, you know, the the contrast between the woman standing there holding two glasses of, was it cherry, cherry brandy? brandy? Cherry brandy. <laughs> and, you know, this sort of, you know, would sort of at times, I imagine, a drudge. Is that too? Yeah. Or, yeah awful. And, um, and, you know, neat, and, and sort of trying to reconcile the two. Mm. But obviously, her, you know, she, it's what, and the thing, the thing that's kind of, I've seen you mention sort of this before, but it's almost like you sort of you you had the musical career, and but it seems to me that you you also ha- have fa- tried to find a way of being that present mother as well, and really enjoying that in the knowledge that no one's forcing you to do it. Yeah, and by and large, it seems to be something that you actually accomplished. Yeah, I mean, you know, bizarrely, if I look back to the years when our kids were small, I did live the life of a housewife, essentially. Mm. But, you know, quite an unusual one, because a housewife who'd had um, 20 years of an interesting and rewarding career of being a pop star and was actually getting a bit fed up with it and so was happy to have a break. Mm. And also a housewife whose husband was working as a DJ and running a small label. So every morning the doorbell would ring and uh, there'd be the postman there with, you know, a today's stack of 12 yeah. inch singles, which would go on in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. So it was kind of fun. There was yeah, a lot yeah. of exciting stuff happening. And I'd still go out dancing when Ben was DJing, yeah. um, get babysitter in and go out yeah. clubbing. So, you know, it was a kind of fun experience of being a housewife. But yeah, I, I definitely wanted to be there for my kids and yeah. I wanted to... I wanted them to have a really stable life. I yeah. wanted them to have a really stable, normal yeah. life with, you know, parents around and mm. taking them to school and cooking their tea and all that. Yeah. Um, so I I was happy to do that. But I suppose I thought, well, look, I found a way of doing that without negating the person I am, mm. you know. And, and, and so then that means when they become teenagers, you can still talk to them because, mm. you know, you still actually are in a place where you can get your head around the fact that, they're going to have sex and take drugs and mm. occasionally do stupid things, but it's, you know, it's yeah. not the end of the world. It's I think there's something appealing that it's like the kind of panther update of um, <laughs> of, of a sort of, of, of a quote-unquote boring life, you know, and it's kind of, yeah, I guess in some ways it's kind of what I've tried, you know, tried to kind of put in place a sort of interesting version of, of a, of a quote-unquote boring life. Yeah. So that, um, <laughs> you know, you sort of, because technology's on our side now, so you yeah. can, you know, you can have the laptop in the kitchen, and you can sort of do all, you know, yeah. administer what you need to administer, yeah, <clears throat> and not all, and and you know, not have to forsake any sort of aspect of it in a yeah. way. Yeah. And of course, so you and was that, and at that point, so you, you, but you never complete. What what was the longest gap between albums for you? I mean, there was a period when the last. Everything But The Girl album was made when our twins were quite small. So the Temperamental album, which was our last album, that came out in, I think, 2000. And I was a little bit only semi-present for that. And we did a little bit of touring where we took the girls with us, but they were like a year old and it was a bit of a nightmare. So that was the point when I kind of stopped um, in sort of the end of 2000. And then the next thing musically I did was my solo album, Out of the Woods, which was 2007. So there's a seven-year gap there where I was being at-home mum. In that time, I wrote Beds at Disco Queen, although I wrote it and then put it in a box under the bed thinking, well, that's not, won't be of any interest to anyone else. (laughs) That's not, that strikes me as a nice way to do it. Yeah. And, um, and did you, did it feel, did you feel like it's... 
Are you quite? I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I guess maybe I'm sort of imposing my sort of guilt onto that kind of situation. But I think I would feel, feel a bit guilty or self-indulgent about kind of spending a huge amount of time doing something that you know I haven't, I haven't shown to anyone. What the book? Yes. I, I don't. For a while, I didn't think about it at all. I honestly thought I would. I had just done it you know, for my own benefit, that it was a sort of reminder to me mm. of what I'd done. I almost felt like I was, I don't know, like keeping the, you know, captain's log or something yeah, of yeah, this yeah. career we'd had. And yeah. so it had to be written down and there it was, it was done now. Yeah. Um, and it got me back into making music. So actually I, I went back to doing that. And then some, uh, Kirsty, who's now my agent, who was actually Ben's literary agent at the time, said to me one day, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I said, well... I mm. did sort of write, it's, you know, it's nothing. I wrote this, bah. and she went, mm. well, can I see it? Mm. I went, mm, right then. Was it genuinely a surprise to you that she thought it was publishable? Yeah, I, I, I said, but it's just like, it's so, you know, much. It's, uh, to me, it felt so niche. Mm. And it. I don't know why. It just hadn't occurred to me, of course, that a lot of other, other people had shared all the early stuff, you know, had had the same experience of growing up and getting into punk and indie yeah. and going to gigs and that then there were people who'd followed our career who would be interested yeah, yeah. um so yeah i was i was surprised and then i think again like we we started out this interview once she'd said that i read it with fresh eyes and suddenly it looked to me like an enormously entertaining book yeah 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 <laughs> it is i think you know because we live in a world where um you know you you know you only need to sort of complain on Twitter about your train being late before someone says uh, you know f f uh, first world problems. Yeah. You. Did was it was there a part of you that sort of wondered whether or not you know like I can't go on. I'm not Malala. Should I really be? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, so maybe there's something a bit indulgent about <laughs> thinking you know this is interesting. But I think I've been cured of that a bit. Actually, the experience now of having published some stuff and writing a column mm. means that I now think, OK, well, look, I love reading stuff by other people about their lives or yeah. about their thoughts, their insights, their reflections. So, you know, of, of course, I've got the right to write things and people might be interested yeah. in them. You know, I think I've got better at, yeah. at feeling, you know, that there is a place for it and not being quite so You do harsh. get to an age as well where you just stop yeah. giving us stuff. And, yeah, um, you know, exactly. Yeah. You get a bit more. I mean, maybe it's to do with being a bit more secure mm. in, in yourself and, you know, thinking that, you know, you have a place, you have a role. And it's I was surprised at times that the the picture of the person you painted in a, in another planet was maybe a bit more insecure than I would have expected, mm. um, and uh, prone to anxiety and mm. all the rest. You know, that was um, had it been a deliberate sort of decision in a way to sort of maybe withhold that uh, side of you from your previous writing. Again, I think that's something that I've only really started to realize about myself quite recently um honestly if you'd asked me years ago i wouldn't have known how to put it into words mm. um and that's partly because you know there's conversations that have been being had in public in recent mm. years about depression and anxiety and mental health issues in general that i just don't think i would have articulated in that way i think i would have just thought oh well yeah i'm a bit like that mm. i didn't know what the word panic attack meant until mm. quite recently and then i look back and thought oh god yeah no i used to get that well mm. that's that's a thing <laughs> other people have that yeah, yeah yeah you know who you just don't know so i to me you know i only had some therapy for the first time in my life very recently you know in the last three or four years mm. um during which i as you do, learn a lot about myself and what made kind sense of, of a lot of things. What kind of therapy? Um, not not totally sort of in-depth analytical going mm. back over my entire childhood. A bit of that, mm. a bit of that, but then a bit more CBT based, just trying to give you kind of strategies for yeah. managing and coping with, which I think is particularly useful with anxiety Yeah, um, right. and just learning how to, I think it's just about learning to put things in perspective a bit and try not to let it. Absolutely, sort of yeah. rule you. Yeah. Um, we're not just anywhere. We're in the offices of the by the colossal, a quite exciting warehouse of Ace Records. Yes. Um, so um, has it, have you seen anything that's taken your fancy? I've, I've snaffled something already that actually isn't even out yet, but that's coming out soon, which is the new Bob Stanley and Pete Wiggs compilation called Three Day Week. 
when the lights went out, <laughs> 1972 to 1975. So it's quite, quite similar kind of era to what I've just written about in Another Planet, although that starts kind of yeah. in 1976. But obviously I remember this era. So it's a good idea. What, 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 what was there, tell, tell us a little bit about what's on the track listing that might have intrigued you. There's the last track on the album is Stardust by David Essex, mm. which is a song that actually appears in <laughs> my book, Another mm, Planet. Mm. I was a massive David Essex fan. And particularly, mm. I loved the two films, That'll Be The Day and Stardust. Yeah. Which, have you seen them? Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. they're quite startling, um, <laughs> quite depressing. They're in incredibly way. depressing. I saw them when I was really young. I mean, way too young to be seeing them, I'm sure. I can't imagine how I got into the cinema to see them but I was mad about him yeah. and Stardust this is you know it's one of David Essex's kind of gloomy hmm. tunes he wasn't all just cheeky chappy fun of the fair stuff. although there was quite a lot of that absolutely yeah but at the same he was like the he was like like he was like the kindly fairground operative yes. so that if you were lost next to the dodgems and you're a bit scared you knew that he would direct you to a safe place yeah, but although not in those films not I think no, where no, no, he was no, very no, much no, no. he was very much yeah. badder and naughtier than that um, yeah, very true. which made him quite exciting so anyway I'm I very much want to listen to this because it's already got something important it is it's quite ti- it timely to not me. only in terms of uh, what you write about but also we may be entering a phase in history which is rather a lot like the post brexit well know. I think this this could be our soundtrack then maybe I there's be. there's some controversial people on here that um lieutenant pigeon mm. there's a track by were you were, which, you, do you, were you a moldy old doe sort of I love that song see I just remember I don't think I liked it no it was no. just one of those omnipresent songs wasn't it there's a kinks track on here um Fun of the there's kinks? all sorts of exciting stuff you know there's Wigan's Ovation, Northern Soul Dancer. Well, well that's uh, it's a good, it's a great idea, I think, in yeah. terms of that that sort of, um, unlike you know, like we said, it's it has that sort of slightly discombobulatingly timely feeling about it that we might, you know, it's kind of if a No Deal Brexit happens, it might all start to get a bit three day week again. I was so. talking earlier about um, remembering that era and the power cuts and stuff and how everyone had their box of prices candles in the yeah. cupboard and how we don't have our box of prices candles anymore but perhaps we should get them in case the lights go out yeah because you don't want to waste that diptyque candle no, exactly. on, on, on you know. don't want any scented candles yeah happening. no one's gonna no, no one that that will be a very first world problems moment if you yes. go on twitter and start talking about <laughs> the wait. lights have gone out but thank god <laughs> thank god I've for got my john galliano mist <laughs> <laughs> candle on uh, the other thing that I should say is amazing about this three-day week record is Bob Stanley's um, notes, sleeve notes yeah. that he's written for it, which are like a book in themselves. I mean, obviously, we know he has written an amazing book about um, the history of pop music. But, you know, you kind of think, God, he could write a book on this subject. Um, he it's is. it's it, amazing stuff and really good, yeah. interesting just about the period and politics and everything that was happening as well as the music. I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, your your sort of evolution as a fan as well. Um, because, and also in a way, sort of trace it with the back to, to the book as well. Because when I, when I think of um, your earlier records... It's you know it's a re- it's it's kind of a privilege in a way to sort of to to read both in Bed Disco Queen and Another Planet this sort of almost you're you're given the tools with which to figure out how to sort of connect to the feeling that you get from a lot of your sort of early solo records and early everything but the girl records um, to the geography of them so this kind mm. of stillness this sort of sense of uh, this slight sense of being at a remove from a place that you feel ambivalent about. But that's not so much other things take over later on. Is that how it seems to you? I mean, it's such a long journey, I think. You know, for me now, when I look back over the music, it it almost falls into, yeah, quite distinct different periods. You yeah. know, like um, looking at Strata of Rock or something. It all, you know, and, and obviously they, they happen one after each other. So each period has a sort of influence on the, the following yeah. one. I mean, I listen back to some of, you know, the the really earliest music I made with the Marine Girls and the first solo album. And it really has got something of that sort of 
like naive art mm. thing about it you know it sounds to me like music made by someone who barely knows what music is yeah yeah <laughs> you know he's clearly sort of passionate about something yeah um but without any knowledge of rules or structures or mm. um, absolutely and, and that's that's sort of amazing i i can see that that was its its power um, if I if I think about very early songs like On My Mind mm. and your version of Night and Day, yeah, I th I think two adjectives that w almost contradict each other, but I don't think do actually um, that c come to mind are uh, soulful and empty. Mm. I hear a lot of, and uh, maybe it's the emptiness of your surroundings or just the kind of bareness of the means by which you recorded them. Yeah, I think it was. I think it's necessity, really. I think it was just. Um, you know, making the most of very limited means, um, you know, barely any instruments, barely any um, ability, mm. <laughs> um, you know, and something about, and, and I think also noticing that that space suited my voice very well. Um, mm. And that's true throughout. That's a through line, I think. You know, the moments that work the best is when we found a way of of combining that space with still... It, this sounds tricky, but still having something edgy about it, yeah. Um, and that's all, that's that's difficult sometimes, you know. Leaving space on records without it, you know, getting just too sort of nice and mellow sounding. Sometimes we fell the wrong side of that, I think, and things did get too gentle and mellow. Right. But when they were at their best, I think it was when we managed to hang on to that sense of space, whilst making sure that whatever there was on the record, you know, had some kind of necessity about it. I know you weren't trying to educate anyone by making records like Eden, <laughs> but at the same time, you did. You know, it was a little bit for someone like me, fourteen years old, not really having, not knowing where I even needed to start sniffing around in terms of sort of jazz and mm. that kind of whole area of music. Um, what what was it that was making you kind of put those elements into? that record in I particular. mean some of that just came from Ben because of his um you know experience via his dad and the house he'd grown up in mm. um you know he grew up listening to a much wider range of music than I did and you know although we shared some things in common in, in terms of having been into some of the sort of post-punk scene to me, that had been my world, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'd sort of devoured it obsessively, and I had loads and loads of singles. Yeah. Whereas when I met him, he didn't have that many singles, but he had lots of albums and much more wide-ranging. So he had jazz records, and he had Can and Kevin Coyne mm. and things like that, do you know what I mean? And sort what did you find yourself perhaps even surprised to find that you were really getting into for the, for, of, of his records? I mean, I, I liked... I didn't like everything he liked and I think we did f and maybe f throughout our career one of the things that worked about our partnership was that we sort of each brought something slightly different to it without ever completely compromising to the extent yeah. that we became each other yeah, yeah. Um, and it you know we never wrote together for instance we always wrote separately we either wrote songs completely on our own or he'd write some music and I'd show him some lyrics, but we never did that sitting around the piano together, you know, yeah. sort of. I'm kind of happy to hear it. All yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I think the strength of a record like Eden, to me, it sounds very much like a record that's made by two people who've pooled their songs, which is exactly what it was. He had six songs for his next solo album. I had six for mine. Yeah. And we thought, well, that, you know. Let's do the record right here. It's funny, really, when you hear like a band s s splitting up due to musical differences, because <laughs> I quite like the bands that come together because of exactly. the musical differences. See, I think there's a strength in that, always. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't... I mean, again, people are a bit weird because they think, you know, because we were a couple and we've been together so long, they kind of imagine we must be almost exactly the same. And, mm. you know, nothing could be further from the truth. We are so different and we have quite different takes on things and quite different likes and dislikes very different personalities mm. you know that to me seems why it works yeah i think <laughs> i think there's definitely an element of that in a lot of you know relationships at yeah. work um of course 
I mean, you know, my first instinct is to ask you about, you know, the records that you really agreed on. But I think a far more interesting question is to ask you about the the, the stuff that the other likes that you just hate. I don't, I don't know. There is much of that, to be honest. I'm, now you've said it, I'm thinking, what is there that I don't think? I don't think there's anything that one of us likes that the other one hates. There's a certain kind of funk um, record that if I play it in the kitchen oh, really? at home, then you know it's kind of the 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 needle which on one hand on on one extreme says married forever, and right. the, on the other <laughs> side says call relate right. is uh, it tips towards the latter is we, we have definite like inclinations of things that we're strong like so ben has a greater fondness than i do when he makes like his mixed tapes i call them or his spin cycle for a certain kind of like slightly sort of jazzy hip-hop stuff quite mm. sort of mellow conscious lyrics lovely mm. Mm. but when i'm teasing him about it i always say oh it's a bit jazz and jewelry <laughs> Which I think is <laughs> Reeves and Mortimer joke about we know what we mean by it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a bit jazz and jewelry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I have a much greater liking for stuff that to him is too poppy. Right, um, okay. He doesn't have a great liking for you know properly highly produced mm. chorus heavy charty girl singer pop, which okay. I can't enough of really so, so those we, are the areas we diverge so you, you name me like a track like a record <laughs> that might be a, an example of that well like he doesn't like stuff like robin and sia and right. tovalo and people like that anywhere near yeah. as much disco tits you know that i would like have played at my funeral right, i think okay. it's probably a bit nails on a blackboard to him okay okay <laughs> uh which brings me to your new album <laughs> <laughs> yeah he doesn't like any of that obviously <laughs> Well, it's not quite that now, is it? <laughs> no, but uh, no. but there is. It's a, you know, I, as you know, I I I love you. I newish now, I guess. Uh, your yeah. album record, and uh, it's a re- it's a it's a record that's palpably made by someone who loves pop for mm. people who to to be listened to by people who love pop. Mm. But at the same time, it's a very it's a kind of by stealth. It's also a very serious record in a way. Yeah, I mean, lyrically, it, it's it's quite weighty. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, if those lyrics were maybe in, you know, slightly more doomy musical context, it would all sound quite heavy. I always like the contrast between light and dark. You know, yeah. I, I, I do get a bit fed up when... Um, dark is often used as the greatest compliment in modern criticism of all art forms oh it's very dark yeah. like equals good yeah and you know i'm not sure i think that's entirely true no, no um so i do i like letting the light in yeah and actually it's almost like you know it's such a it's quite a kind thing to do actually to yeah. sort of like if you're gonna sort of write about something that's, that's you know sort of quite potentially depressing subject matter hmm. to sort of leaven it musically and i was making the record to cheer myself up for god's sake i yeah. mean i started writing it in the aftermath of you know the brexit vote and trump hmm. and i was literally getting to that mood of being so weighed down by the news and by consuming it on twitter and getting drawn into you know everyone ranting and raving and i just thought i'm going a bit mad here this yeah. is terrible i need to I need to get involved in a project that's going to take me away from all this and, you know, give me something yeah. to do for a while. And I thought, well, I've got a couple of songs. Let's let's try and write a couple more and see if I get anywhere. What so was I was doing it to, to try and, you know, Not too many myself. people are doing it. I mean, it's kind of like, it's, there's you and there's the Pet Shop Boys. I'm not really <laughs> sure how many more people are really sort of a kind of occupying that space there are probably loads i just can't think of any off the top of my it's head it's hard to think of things no. off the top of your head no we don't need to no. um what so what was the song which sort of you know there's usually a song which kind of you know shines the angle angle poise on sort of the rest of the album yeah i mean i would say it's probably sister which sits right in the middle of the album mm. um and was written about the middle of the album as well in terms of the writing process dance floor i'd had for a while that had been hanging although originally it started life as a quite a sadder ballad i had the verse which the lyrics of which are all quite sad mm. and it was a much slower song which i really liked though i really liked the tune of it and i liked the lyrics but i just thought no, this is just too miserable no one wants, no one needs this <laughs> so i kind of sped it up and then wrote a chorus about dancing and it works much better but when i wrote sister 
I thought, okay, so this is the kind of idea now, you know, a really strong lyric, but with a really strong groove. So yeah. this is going to be the sort of idea of it. You must have done a little bit of an inward high five when you came up with the line, and I fight like a girl. I don't think I really came up with it. I nicked it off a banner oh, well. um, at the Women's March. Well, hats off, anyway. And saw, you know, someone was carrying this banner that just said fight like a girl, and I just thought, well, if that hasn't been used an awful lot, then I'll, yeah. you know, I'll use it. And I went home and kind of Googled it to see how many times it had been used in things. It is out there a little bit. Yeah. Um, as a, I think it was the title of something, but I thought, okay, it hasn't been done to death, so I'll have it. <laughs> On the rare occasions I can haul myself out for, for a run, um, <laughs> it really works, that song. It kind good. of, it's yeah. a good sort of motivational song, you know. And I do all my music listening now when I'm marching across the heat, so I'm, it's another thing that that makes me listen to more upbeat music mm. because I'm always listening to music when I'm on the move. Ben listens to a lot more music at home. He has music on when he's pottering about or in on his laptop, which again, I think is what steers him in the jazz and jewellery direction. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas I'm always marching about. And it's, um, do you sort of, and that sort of embrace of, were you all, did that kind of pop loving side to you, was it, were you always sort of connected with it, even sort of, in the 80s where things were a little bit more tribal? Uh, well, I was, gonna, I was nodding there furiously as you started because at the beginning I was very much so when I was younger mm. and even when I got into punk, you know, I loved the Marvelettes and the Velvelettes and Leslie Gore and yeah. stuff as much as I liked my punk records. Yeah. I wasn't so sure about the kind of pop through the 80s. I mean, maybe it was by then because, because things became a bit more tribal and you were sort of anti-things. Yeah. And I suppose, look, I'm not, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of 80s pop production. Mm. Um, you know, we were a little bit at odds with it always and, um, you know, a bit anti-production and mm. a bit trying not to have the 80s snare sound on our records. So now that it's become a sort of entirely beloved sound, yeah, there is weird. part of me that goes, mm. we were kind of trying not to do that. But that, But that's probably because of being the age I was at that time. I wasn't a teen pop fan by then. I was someone in their 20s in the music business who had a slightly jaded view yeah, yeah. of some of the way in which pop music was being made. And That's one of the handy things about having children is that they can surprise you by kind of adopting sort of 80s pop records that, mm. you, you, that you just assumed no one of any ensuing generations could possibly like. Yeah. And my, I just certainly find, I find mine doing that a lot. It's great because it allows me to hear them with fresh ears as well. Oh, it's fascinating watching kids go back and rediscover things i mean all of ours have gone through different things when one of the girls first started going out like to clubs in her teens and she'd go off to shoreditch and stuff and go out clubbing and she'd come home and i'd go so what what were you dancing to and she said just disco 1970s disco <laughs> and i'd be like what yeah, yeah. <laughs> can i come yeah. <laughs> seriously i thought you'd be like listening to some berlin you know trance track or something but no no they were that was that was the phase at that time then it went through a phase when they were all dancing to kind of 90s r&b for a bit yeah yeah my so, yeah my oldest is has not let go of that yeah and uh Funny a little though, kind of it? quirky kind of aberrations like my youngest um africa by toto came on the radio oh. she said oh, this is a tune i said really <laughs> says, oh yeah yeah all the um all the road men, all the road, all the road men in my year love this. Oh and you know, God. for for listeners who don't necessarily know what the term road man means, mm. it's uh, sort of t typically sort of teenage boys who define themselves, uh, especially musically, with kind of grime yeah. and uh, everything that goes with that. So, but apparently they all make an honourable exception for Africa because they oh, just think it just wait till they hear Phil Collins. Well, quite yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> You are, and quite rightly so, um, often sp spoken about, um, especially these days, as, as, as a soul singer and uh, as someone who who's a lot of what people love about your voice uh, accords with what a lot of people love about soul music. So uh, that would lead me, maybe naively, to assume that you're a big fan of soul music as well. Um, what in that domain tends to sort of get your attention? I mean, I I am kind of a soul singer, but I'm a I'm a, a minimalist, aren't I? So, 
Um, you know, that what that means is I love maximalists. <laughs> I love the ones who can do all the stuff I can't do. I've talked about that a bit before and people are always shocked when... Like, it's well, like, you know, I mean, you know, the Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey style yeah. of, you know, that some people are so anti, you yeah. know, that they singing all went wrong at that yeah. point, you know, when, when they started doing all the... Um, vibrato madness. What's um, your? But there's a, part of me that absolutely loves that because I can't do it. You can know, you know, is it melisma? Is it melisma? That, is, is, that, the, that, is the that word? Wibbly the wibbly, wibbly, wobbly. Yeah. Yeah. Can I mean, you, I can do a little bit of vibrato, but not proper. Really? You soul. couldn't. You couldn't go. Not churchy vibrato. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, I I do like listening to people who can do the things I can't do. I mean, now I think you know, singing has become very mannered. There's a lot of what seem to me more vocal tics and mannerisms than mm. individual style which can be a bit annoying yeah yeah um yeah i, I yeah I, I i i'm struggling a bit with a lot of the modern kind of the kind of yeah that sort of it seems to be a post talent show way of sort of singing it's true and i feel you know i've defended those kind of shows and things in the past and I've defended autotune which I absolutely think has its place and I know people rant against that as well but you know there is a danger that things are becoming now incredibly homogenised What about going further back sort of in the pantheon? Um, um, Oh Donny Hathaway I suppose Okay That's uh, what everything is everything and Yeah yeah, I mean, amazing singing, just, yeah. you know, that sort of fluidity and ease and passion that I think's there. Do you have occasion to... Now, I ask this, you know, so I'm almost scared of asking people, I was going to say, do you have occasion to go to record shops? And I think when when I ask this question of people, I'm slightly worried that they expect, they think I might disappove of them some, somehow. Oh, what, for not? Yeah, yes. and I honestly don't care, but no. I'm just interested. <laughs> the answer is no from me. No, I really don't. I'm, I mean, I'm, this, I shouldn't be saying this in the, in the um, you know, and next to this warehouse of stuff, but I'm, I am someone who actually is quite grateful for the fact that we can now listen to our music without having to have all the stuff. Yeah. Um, I was never, I think when I was younger, you know, I did used to like pouring over the artwork and the sleeves and everything, but now I'm actually perfectly happy to sort of just have it as a, as pure sound in my ears without the, the attendant. Yeah. Um, physical stuff. I guess it's the more ecologically sound option. (laughs) I suppose so. I mean that, but that's yeah. yeah. That's not a reason. Not. No, 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 no. <laughs> How about Ben? Um, yeah, he's a bit the same as well. Um, he's I think maybe again from the experience of having DJ'd and run a label, yeah. where for a while, you know, our, as I say, our house was, you know, just literally every morning you open the door to more. 12 inch yeah, vinyl yeah. arriving and he DJed during the period when it was still carrying record boxes around as well and put his back out lifting one of them up into an overhead bin on the plane on his way to DJ Did somewhere really? yeah literally oh my word felt his back go <laughs> what happened so that was horrible I think he just had to carry on got some painkillers and carried on DJing but it is it's some. it's an it's an oft uh, undiscussed uh, yeah because I'm I still just about hanging on in there with yeah. my, my big heavy boxes, mainly but, because I'm too much t- technologically ignorant to know. How well, to then it, then he ended up, you know, then CDs. But then now I suppose people don't even have any physical product at all while Indeed. they're DJing, and that's that's a whole nother thing. It is, and one that we <laughs> probably won't venture into. One right that we at don't know anything moment. about. Uh, no, indeed, absolutely. <laughs> um, so when's the book out, Tracy? The book's out uh, Feb. February the seventh, and you kind of you do you. You're very good at that whole sort of sitting in front of an audience talking about your life and your book and stuff. So um, I guess you've got a bit of that. I have got way. a bit of that. I've got some events um, planned, which I I kind of put a tweet out a couple of days ago announcing the um, reading dates I was doing, at which you then just get met by hundreds of replies going. <laughs> Are you coming to Hull? Are you coming to Leeds? Are you coming to California? And you've just given them the list of all the places you're going. I think it's quite. That's why you've done it. I think it's quite funny that you're sort of like, <laughs> like you know, it's quite ironic, really, because at the beginning of your book, you talk about because there's a bit in the beginning of your book where you talk about your teenager diary, and you notice that you have a tendency to focus on all the things that haven't happened yeah. on that particular yeah, day. Yeah, the things I'm 
didn't do. <laughs> and now you're confronted by fans yeah. doing exactly the same thing, telling you I where know. you're telling not playing. Telling you where I'm not coming. <laughs> I know. So okay. that's that's a thing. You have to just slightly breeze past the fact that, yeah, people yeah. are cross with you for not coming to their town. But well, on that elegant anyway. completion of a circle, Tracy. Very neat. Thank you. I'm thank going you. to release you back into the wild. Oh, marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for keeping me company for the last hour. You've been listening to the Ace Records podcast with myself, Pete Pavides, uh, speaking with Tracy Thorne. Bye-bye. For more excellent music, you can scoot over to the Ace Records website, www.acerecords.co.uk all the wonderful music you could possibly need.